Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here to talk to you about the Carlos Kleiber Deutsche Grammophon box Blu-ray thing, thing stuff. This is the complete DG recordings on regular compact discs and also on Blu-ray audio. So in order to get started, I need to tell you where I stand on Blu-ray audio. I don't care. That's where I stand. I've had it with format wars. Now, this is an, a, a, an expression of my lifelong experience. And some of you who are younger, who are just building your collections, if you want to get into it, get into it. It's fun. I mean, all this technological stuff is great. I'm past it. I'm really past it. I don't have a Blu-ray player. I have no intention of getting a Blu-ray player. Here's like a little history for those of you who are a little bit younger and who haven't been through all of this kookiness. The original battle, and I'm not going to go back to like the 1950s where it was like 45s versus 33s and LPs versus extended play stuff and mono versus stereo. I mean, in, in, the, in the modern world, let's say since the 70s, originally there was Sony Betamax versus VHS. Remember that? Some of you may. Everybody knew that Betamax was the better system, but VHS won the war. And that became the standard for video, at least for video. Then when we got to digital recordings, we had a whole bunch of things happening. The most, after the initial CD thing calmed down and everyone got their, their normal compact discs, we had, remember, mini discs? Remember those? They were like yay big. And then we had digital laser discs. I mean, I had players for all of this stuff. It was ridiculous. And never mind eight track cassettes and all that, all, you know, all that other nonsense that was going on. I mean, there have been so many different sound media over the years. And what matters really is that the industry has to get behind a standard and support it and support it uniformly because only that really justifies the outlay that you're going to make in buying new equipment all the time. So once compact discs got going, there was a war, a war, I mean, boo, a war, <laughs> war between SACD and DVDA, which was DVD audio. And I remember vividly going to Medem, the Marche International du Disque Edition Musicale, the convention in Cannes, France, where I was running the Cannes Classical Awards and covering the thing as a journalist and whatnot, and having these wonderful exhibits where you would sit in a room full of egg carton hoochies and enormous speakers with, you know, nuclear powered amplifiers hooked up to each one. And they were fighting it out between SACD and DVDA. There wasn't really a heck of a lot of difference between them. Everybody argued back and forth. But what really mattered was not the format per se, but whether the recording was a good recording to begin with. And most of the recordings that were converted to SACD or DVDA for the purpose were bad. They were bad recordings. I mean, they were just lousy in any format. It didn't matter what the format was. And that's true with Blu-ray audio. It's true with all of this stuff. You can remaster and demaster and unmaster and do whatever you want to do. But if the basic recording was not a good one to start with, then it's going to sound like possibly a slightly improved version of not a good one. And I'm not interested in that. I'm not an audiophile. I have a big, glamorous, high-powered system with fabulous custom-built speakers. I have a bookshelf audio system for my bedroom. I have my AirPods. I want music wherever I am. And as long as it sounds reasonably decent, I'll probably be pretty happy with it. Yes, of course, I prefer better sound than not better sound. If something is really well remastered, that's a nice thing too. But I don't make a fetish of it, and I don't get into it the way I used to because I'm simply done buying audio equipment. I want to have a nice sounding system that's good for most purposes. I do not sit in a listening room in a chair 
on a spot where the image is absolutely perfect. I get up, I move around, I read, I do other things. While I'm listening to music all the time, I can multitask. I'm sure many of you can too. I mean, when the SACD surround sound thing happened, I got a surround sound system. That was supposed to be a big deal, but the industry didn't support it. Some labels did SACD surround, some didn't. They never got it right. Some recordings sounded fantastic. Some sounded just awful with strange things happening behind you. I got rid of my surround sound system and have never missed it. Never. I'm very, very happy with good, solid, warm, naturally balanced stereo. What a great invention that was, and what a great invention that remains. All of which is a long way of saying, this comes with all the DG recordings on regular compact discs, and then there are a couple Blu-rays at the back, which fit all the stuff on compact disc onto just a couple discs, and I assume they have rays, and I assume those rays are blue, and I couldn't care less. As far as I'm concerned, it's just another way that the labels have to make you pay more to get the same old stuff. And if you want to get the Blu-ray thing, maybe someday when you replace your equipment, you'll have Blu-ray capability, you may want to get this. There's also a complete Clyber DG box that doesn't have the Blu-ray, and you might as well get that if you don't have Blu-ray. You're not missing anything, as far as I'm concerned, and that's my personal take on it. So, you know, you may feel otherwise, and you may comment and say, well, yes, it's better, it's this, it's that. You get no argument from me. I just don't care. I don't think it's important enough to waste my time on. Certainly not more important than just enjoying the music as it stands and as it has stood since the day it was issued. Some of these recordings were always very good. Some of them were a little bit less good. And I suspect that they're still going to sound that way no matter what they do to them because a balance is a balance is a balance. If the oboe is louder than the trombones, then it's going to sound better and louder than the trombones. You know what I mean? So let's talk about the performances. Carlos Kleiber, what a phenomenon he was. I have a little bit of conflicted feelings about him because he was a great conductor. He limited his recordings very wisely. He is a a a fabulous example of the idea that there's value in scarcity. He created a mythos around himself and around his work by making very infrequent appearances. Apparently, he was very hesitant to perform. I saw him live a few times. The performances were magnificent. I've heard everything he's done on disc, a lot of the pirate stuff, and the pirate stuff, you may be interested to know, is not necessarily better or worse than anybody else's pirate stuff. There are days when he was on and days when he was off. And he was just like the rest of us mortal human beings. He could be great and not so great. I have issues about his choice of repertoire. I have issues about what he recorded because the fact of the matter is, the fact of the matter is, he basically was a clone of his dad, Eric Kleiber. And I think Eric Kleiber was a great, great conductor. I mean, he gave the premiere of Wozzeck, you know, that's exciting. But beyond that, you know, when I do A-B comparisons between Eric Kleiber's work and Carlos Kleiber's work, I generally prefer his dad. Um, and I think that, I think that, you know, he spent uh, so much of his career in the shadow of his incredibly famous father. And that's a difficult thing. And that may have led to his being so, so comparatively infrequent in his appearances. He used to joke about it. He would say that, you know, he needed to buy a new refrigerator. He would go give a concert. He'd get, he'd get money. And that's why he did it when he, he came out from, from his hermitage and he would give a concert and make a pile of money and then stop. He did, of course, a lot more in concert live than he ever recorded. I mean, his career was was a bit more a bit more um, out there and and fulsome than his limited discographic legacy would suggest. But let's go through these disc by disc because there's very few of them, and we will see what the best stuff is. First, let's just say the box comes in one of these. It's a slipcase style since we're talking about packaging, and the slipcases have 
have these little gatefold hoojis. And, um, and they're actually pretty good. It's just a little cardboard sleeve. And in the cardboard sleeve is a disc that you could actually take out and put back without causing hysteria. I actually think that's pretty good. So first we get his famous, illustriously famous, Beethoven 5 and 7 with the Vienna Philharmonic. Now, the 5th is an iconic version of the 5th. It's a great Beethoven 5th without question. The 7th I find less persuasive. I think his DVD live one, which I think is going to be issued on compact disc with Concerto Bell, that 7th I think is better than this 7th. He always did what his father did at the end of the Allegretto, you know, where you have pizzicato and he keeps the pizzicato pizzicato instead of returning to arco strings i don't know why he did that i don't think he needed to do it just because his father did it i don't think it makes any difference in our understanding of the performance i find both performances for my taste just a little bit faceless they're kind of you know fast and driven in the toscanini mold um they're they're very strict they're very very well done they're magnificently played but, you know, the fifth always, I've always come away from it feeling that there's more personality in the music that he, than he gives it. More sense of struggle in the first movement, a little more transparency to the textures in the finale, a little more attention to the bass lines would have been nice. But I'm in a minority. Most people think that fifth is fabulous. But the seventh, oddly enough, I think suffers more from the approach. And people don't talk about this seventh as amongst the great sevenths. And I think when you listen to it, it will leave you a little bit cold too. It, it just it just does. It has a relentlessness of rhythm without, I think, a, a countervailing attention to, to color and and the the emotional ambience of the music. It seems like he wants to get through it. And that's the way I feel about it. So that's that one. Brahms 4. Oh, remember Brahms 4? This is, again, an excellent Brahms 4. And I remember when it was released, and everyone went, oh my God, the Kleiber Brahms 4. It's a very good Brahms 4. Again, not one of my favorite Brahms 4s. And for much the same reason as the Beethoven. It's a neat, clean, very well played performance. And I remember it has like one interpretive interpretive element one obvious interpretive move right in the first movement you know when it goes da 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 you know he does that thing and he makes a little luft pause and the little luft pause allows him to take a breath and then phrase down and i thought oh isn't that beautiful wouldn't it be lovely if he did something else somewhere else instead of just playing it straight and somewhat mechanically it has a very, very fine finale. I'll give it that. It really does. Sensible tempos, again, beautiful playing. The digital recording was always a little bit glassy, and so it remains. Maybe it doesn't sound that way on Blu-ray. You can tell me. I don't know. Oh, the Schubert disc. The Unfinished and the Third. The Unfinished is very, very good. It's an excellent performance of the unfinished, I think, especially for its its clarity and its power in the first movement development section and some gorgeous, gorgeous playing from the Vienna Philharmonic in the second movement, the Andante. The third is not very good. It really isn't, especially the, the Allegretto, the slow movement, technically, it is so fast and so insensitive. And I think that this performance, this misjudgment, if we should call it, really, really gives you a, 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 a sense of what I kind of find um, unappealing about some of the other performances. The fact that there's a certain element of mechanicalness in the way he conducts this music. And, uh, you know, that's just how I feel about it. I never liked that third. Too many good ones to worry about Kleiber's. Let's see. Uh, now we get to operas. That's it. That's it for orchestral music. You know, he wrote just very few orchestral recordings. And uh, like so many conductors these days, he was a much better, I think, operatic accompanist than he was an orchestral conductor, a standalone orchestral conductor. Good as these are, and I, I freely confess that some of them are great, if not necessarily to my taste, but they are excellent performances of their type. Flatermouse, a famous Flatermouse. You know, when you're doing opera, what matters 
more than the conductor is the singers. And it's interesting that aside from Tristan and Isolde, which we'll get to in a moment, he didn't really do conductor's operas. He did singer's operas. And so the singers really matter. And Kleiber, in this case, was quite lucky because he did splendid productions with top-notch singers. I saw him do Otello at the Met, and it was fantastic, not just because of the singing was absolutely fantastic, but he really had the performance in his hands. He shaped it and molded it magnificently. It was a great, great Otello. Fabulous Otello. And I remember, I remember marvelous. It was marvelous. And the first movement was coming to an end. And I was sitting next to these two guys who were there to for the operatic experience, not necessarily for the singing. And I had a friend and we had a subscription together. And she was she was a serious opera person. And they would always start applauding before the curtain came down. They wanted to be the first on their feet screaming bravo. And and at the end of, I think it was act two, I don't know, the curtain is coming, starting to come down. They're up screaming and yelling. And fine, the music is still playing, of course. And, and my friend leapt over me. She was a petite charming, delightful person and grabbed this guy, grabbed this guy by the scruff of the neck and said, knock it off. And he just looked at her and said, it's about passion, honey. It was a lot of fun. And the other thing I remember vividly about the Otello, aside from Kleiber's performance, was the fact that actually two things, I got to tell you these stories because they're, they really are kind of fun was that our series that year was the the German special. It had like The Ring and Die Frau und Schatten. It was all Strauss and all Wagner and Othello. And we're watching Othello. We get to the end of the first act and we just looked at each other and said, it's over already? I mean, we just couldn't believe how fast the whole thing went in Verdi compared to Wagner and Strauss. It was as if it, we just sat down and already we were in act two, you know? It moved at the speed of light. And then on the other side of us was an elderly lady, a, a, a charming elderly lady who was st sitting at the program and on the, the uh, program that year also was was the production with Jesse Norman of, of Bluebeard's Castle and Schoenberg's Erwartung. There was that double bill that featured Jesse Norman. And the Bluebeard's Castle was really demented because it starred, I think, Sam Raimi as Bluebeard. And he was actually blue. And as the production went on, he like took all of his clothes off. And he was like one of those blue men. And just the kind of guy you think Judith would want to marry, right? And when they get to the fifth door, you know, the big door, you see his realm. It's like an electric, the, the doors were like, she had an electric garage door opener. <laughs> she would push a button and the thing would go up. And and at this point, the whole set opens up and it turns out that they're in orbit. And that Bluebeard is an alien who'd kidnapped Judith to go on to his space station and and the the produ producer who was some Swedish guy I think got booed at the end, which I thought was great because he really deserved it. It was a lot of fun. But anyway, this this old lady is looking at the program and she turns to me and she says, "Excuse me, excuse me, is this the same Bartok who wrote the Miraculous Mandarin?" And I said, "Yes, it is. In fact." You know, Bluebeard's Castle was part of a trilogy that included the Miraculous Mandarin. And she said, oh, that's wonderful. That's my favorite piece of music. I play the Miraculous Mandarin every morning when I have coffee. And I just looked at her and said, hmm, interesting, very interesting. And she said, you know, my husband was, was Peter Bartok's law partner. And I said, oh, okay, that was kind of cool. Anyway, that was my Carlos Kleiber experience at the Met, more or less. He did a great Otello. It's a pity he didn't get a chance to record it. But we're on Fleeter Mouse after that ridiculous digression. And it's really, really a good Fleeter Mouse. It's got Hermann Pry and Julia Varade and 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 Rene Colo and Bern Weichel and Lucia Pop and I mean just it's just a who's who of Mousians. So it's great. What's not to love? That's absolutely fantastic. And, you know, Kleiber, in his pit version of himself, 
was a very, very sympathetic accompanist, one who shaped and molded the orchestral parts magnificently while always allowing the singers the opportunity to sing. And that is the mark of a really great conductor. He didn't, he didn't take over the production. He conducted with humility, but with supreme mastery of the score. And you hear that time and time again. You hear it in this, the great, really the best modern Traviata recording with Ileana Kortrubash's absolute best performance. And I, I chatted with her about it. She agreed. She was very, very happy with it, and rightly so. And who else is in this? Oh, it's like all kinds of other people, Placido Domingo and Cheryl Milnes. And, you know, again, really wonderful casting and an absolutely fantastic version of the accompaniment. So the Traviata is justly famous. A really, really fine performance. And then there's Tristan und Isolde. Ah, Tristan, it's Wagner. Now, most people, I don't think, believe this is one of the great Tristans. I mean, you've got the, the Karl Böhm Bayreuth with Birgit Nielsen, and, and you, you know, you're not going to beat that. You just aren't. It's that simple. It's that great, you know. And Margaret Price is is a wonderful, wonderful singer. And I really, I, I just think she does a beautiful, very feminine, some very kind of girlish Isolde. She is not the typical Wagnerian soprano. She was lucky to get Kleiber conducting because, again, he's very kind to the voices. And you have, let's see, Rene Colo as Tristan. He's not, he wasn't really a held in tenor. He was kind of a held in tenor. But he does a very good job. And Court Mall is King Mark. And let's see who else is in here. Oh, yes. Fish Disc, Dietrich Fischer Dieskau, kind of over the hill, a little dry of tone. He's Corvinal. And who's who's singing Merlot? I don't know. Well, Werner something. Werner Goetz is Merlot. And Brigitte Fassbender is Brangana. Brangane. It's it's a an extremely good Tristan. It's kind of lean and and fleet. But if you've got like Fort Fanglers with, with Kirsten Flagstad, which is one of the great ones, or the Carl Böhm Bayreuth, one of those classic ones, I don't think that this one is going to blow your mind the way that, for example, the Traviata does, which is really fantastic. I love the Traviata. And best of all, best of all, this is the best of all. Freischutz. Der Freischutz is one of those operas that has a wonderful reputation. I mean, it has, you know, it's the first great German romantic opera, but it doesn't have a lot of great recordings. And for some reason, for some reason, it, it, it doesn't it doesn't excite people the way some of these other operas do. I mean, maybe it's because the plot's stupid and no one really knows what happens. All I know is there's this guy, you know, he, there's Agatha and there's a, he makes magic bullets, this shooter guy, and he wants to win a shooting contest. And there's a evil devil thing named Casper. And Casper wants the, 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 the gun to shoot Agatha for some reason. There's no reason that he wants the gun to shoot her. He just does. And there's this holy hermit so that the gun doesn't shoot Agatha. I mean, it's just ridiculous. But the music is gorgeous. And it had never, never been conducted with this much flair, attention to detail, and and dramatic, dramatic verisimilitude. I mean, he really makes the piece work. And again, you have an amazing cast. It's Bern Weichel and Siegfried Vogel and oh, Gundula Janowitz is Agatha and Edith Mattis and Theo Adam and Peter Schreier and Franz Kras. And oh my God, you were never going to get a cast doing a better Freischutz. And I really think this was a performance that, that elevated the work to an entirely different standard because, you know, its popularity in German-speaking lands was one of those, those things that kind of made it be taken for granted and be recorded by, you know, a lot of sort of what you might call provincial German performers in provincial German opera houses. And so when Kleiber came along, he really revealed the work as the international masterpiece, in a sense, that it should it should have been. Then, of course, Kubelik's recording, which is also very good, came along on Decca and it had more sound effects. Ah, oh, wow, it has a tam-tam in the Wolf's Glen scene. What could be bad? But, but Kleiber plays it straight, 
and it is an absolutely fabulous, fabulous performance and probably the most important recording he ever made because that's the performance where he showed what he could do in a work that hadn't been done to death or that hadn't been recognized as the classic that it truly deserves to be. And when most people went out to get Freischutz, they got the Kleiber. That was their introduction to Freischutz and Kleiber. And so it remains. Finally, you get these, 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 this Blu-ray disc. And this Blu-ray disc has all of the stuff on it. It's amazing what they can stuff on a Blu-ray disc. Eh, I'm never going to listen to it. So that's the way it goes. And then there's a fabulously hagiographic booklet, which is all about Kleiber. And, you know, you have pictures of Kleiber. So you can see all the Kleiberness and Kleiberosity to your life's, your heart's desire. And with that, we have the Kleiber edition. So where, where are we at the end of the day? There's no question that Carlos Kleiber was a great conductor. Um, I, there's no question that his, I think his limited discography represents him well. It does him justice. It's certainly worth having. I mean, there's no question that you probably will want this set if you don't have it already. But as I said, whether you really love the performances or not, in the orchestral music, it's going to be purely a matter of taste because his repertoire was so limited and he never he never took the time to do things that other people weren't doing to death. So there's tremendous competition. He holds his own. But I don't know. When I reach for Beethoven's seventh or the Schubert third, I'm not picking Kleiber or the Brahms fourth. Yeah, probably not either. There's so many great recordings of this music. And I don't think he brings enough that's special to justify thinking that these are the best. You know, they may rank with the best. Uh, I, I, I think I think some of them do. I think the Beethoven's Fifth certainly does. But as far as the operas go, well, there you have uh, just an amazingly distinguished discography, limited though it may be. And so I can recommend those with full-hearted enthusiasm as much for the super superb singing and casting as for Kleiber himself. His ability to work and coordinate with singers, I think that's really where his greatness shines most vividly. And so if you like vocal music and you like opera, that's where you find the essential Kleiber, in my opinion. So thank you, folks. Keep on listening. Take care. <laughs>